name of Jesus. I was read a, a, about, I read about a story of a ship during wartime, a small, small vessel during wartime that was sunk, and everybody was drowned or lost their lives except for one sailor. This one sailor that fought for his life was able to find an abandoned island, and for the longest time was the only survivor on this island. And he had made the SOS signs, he lit fires, he did all the stuff that he was trained to do on this little bit of remote island. And finally, weeks and weeks have gone by when he notices a naval ship in the distance. And he notices an American ship and he gets a little excited. He sees a little vessel start collaring out for him and the vessel comes up. But the vessel stops offshore a little bit of a ways. The man jumps off and comes up with a stack of papers in plastic. <coughs> And then hands it to him and says, Sir, we're so glad to find you. You've been missing. We're glad that we have a survival from the ship. However, the captain wanted me to bring you all these local newspapers from back home for the last couple months, and we want you to read these and then decide, do you really want to go back home, or are you cool right here? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but can we just get a show of hands? How many of y'all would stay on that island? Wouldn't that be nice? I'm going to tell you right now, I ain't going to lie. I ain't going to hide it. I would stay there, especially if I had my holly in. That's all I need. I'm telling you, I'd be all about it. With the thing, the way this world is these days, I guarantee the vast majority of us, even if we said no, we put some very good thoughts in there for a while. We can really, I mean, that'd be normal. It's an island. It can't be that bad. Is our food drinks alive or provided? Uh, we have a bunch of questions. We want to know the answers. Uh, in this morning's section of 1 Timothy that we're in, in our Protect This House series, Paul talks about shipwrecks and warfare. The spiritual war Paul talks about here is the same <coughs> battle that Jesus talked about. It's the same battle that the prophets of the Old Testament talked about. It's the same never-ending war we find ourselves in still today. Tragically, y'all, there's a lot of casualties in this spiritual battle that we're in. Too many people have been shipwrecked. Too many people have even shipwrecked their own faith and spiritually speaking, they're suffering. So y'all listen to what Paul says in today's session, just three simple verses. 1 Timothy chapter 1 is where we're at. Look at verses 18, 19, and 20 with me. Paul says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the, pro uh, the prophecies previously made about you so that by recalling them, you might fight the good fight, having faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Three verses, short, sweet, to the point, y'all. But these three verses are actually filled with some important truths that we need to dig in and check out for our own sake, all right? After Paul spent some time preaching last week on being sinners saved by grace, he returns to his primary purpose and theme for writing young Timothy. The need for Timothy, this young preacher, to deal with the false teachers and false teachings in Ephesus. Paul knows that the spiritual battle ain't easy. Paul knows the thing that he will have to face. Church, standing for truth. It's always a challenge in battle. Standing for truth is always a challenging battle. If you work in the public, it's even more challenging. Can I get an amen on that one? Woo! Some people want to try the Jesus in you. Sometimes you are told you can't talk about that here. We can't teach that here. Well, legally, actually, you can. But it's going to be a battle. Church, standing for the truth is always a challenging battle. Folks don't want God's truth. They want to have their ears tickled. They want to tell what they like and what they love is okay. I ain't worried about what I don't like, but what I want, I need. So you just make sure that that's okay. We want to know what we want, and we ain't worried about anything else. Paul knew that Timothy needed encouragement to fight the good fight. We notice in verse 18, Paul brought up again the fact that Timothy is the son of his faith. And again, Paul uses the word instruction like he did back in verse 5 of chapter 1 when he wrote, the goal of this instruction is love. Paul's trying to grab a hold of Timothy and shake him away as a young preacher and showing the need to 
protect the church family, the house of God. Paul wasn't trying to give Timothy a suggestion. Rather, my man's using his dad voice here and giving a command to make sure it's heard. Y'all know what I'm talking about, that dad voice? Like you can hear mom say it a thousand times, but I'll say it like, hey. Everybody listens to dad. Dad can get your attention because you might even, at least in my home when I was growing up, you heard, hey. And if you kept on, the next time you heard was, and that felt getting ripped out. I'm telling you, you knew that sound full well. You, I don't know where you were. You, the, the senses just start getting you. So this right here is not a suggestion. Paul is using his dad voice, church. Paul is using his dad voice and giving a command. And what was the command? I would really think it's a, spe a special task that Paul gave to Timothy uh, for his ministry in Ephesus back in verse 3 of chapter 1. Where just a little earlier in the letter, just a little bit earlier, he says, Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine. Paul mentioned that this command to Timothy was in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning Timothy. The gift of prophecy was part of God's arrangement for guiding the church in its infancy stages before the New Testament was even written and they could read it like we do today. Paul didn't specifically uh, say, he didn't specify here what prophecies uh, about Timothy, what the prophecy was, because Paul's not right to us. We don't even know what was being said about Timothy. It'd be cool, it'd be nice, and oh wow, that actually did happen. But it's not important. Paul was writing to Timothy. Timothy knew what the current prophecy was. He knew what the content of the prophecy was all about. They more than likely talked about this plenty as they walked together, as they trained together, as they ministered together. We can assume that the prophecy was consistent with Paul's present charge to Timothy to be his good needed at this church that he's a preacher of. And we can also assume that being reminded of the prophecy would resurrect Timothy's emotions. It would refocus his mind. It would help him and lead Timothy to be inspired and encouraged. It would also enable him to more effectively engage in this spiritual battle for that church family and protect the house. It's possible that these prophecies related to Timothy's selection by Paul to be part of his mission team uh, and his subsequent setting apart by the elders of the church of uh, uh, Lystra. Later in chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul urges Timothy not to neglect the gift that was given him through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on Timothy. We don't see this ceremony often any longer, but it is a humbling and beautiful thing to see the elders of the church family lay hands on somebody for ministry. Church, I'm going to tell you right now, the most beautiful church services I've ever seen are baptisms, period. The next to that is watching the leaders, the men of the church, put their hands on somebody and pray over them. As deacons, as fellow elders, as small group leaders, as folks getting ready to leave mom and dad's house and go into the mission field or to leave and go to colleges, to see the elders lay hands and pray, Woo! I just got chills like last week, church. I'm telling you right now, it is the most beautiful thing to see men of God lay hands on you and pray of you for sickness, for whatever you're going through, for your marriage, to call upon the elders and pray. It is beautiful to see. And it's not only beautiful, church. It's biblical and it's needed. Whatever was said by the elders over Timothy and whatever gift God had imparted him surely gave Timothy hope strength, and courage when Paul reminded him all about it. <coughs> so we don't know what the prophecies were, but Timothy did. This reminder would help Timothy realize that God had foreseen this moment, this moment in time, <coughs> and that God would not have commissioned him if it wasn't a job he needed Timothy to do. With God's help, Timothy could win the victory and complete the assignment. Paul's challenge uh, for Timothy. Paul challenged Timothy to fight the good fight. We use that over and over again. I don't care what athletic event you're going to, you will most likely hear one or two comments from Paul being said, either to fight the good fight or to finish the race. If you've ever been in athletics, you've heard some preacher, some coach, somebody say, guys, we got to fight this good fight. Guys, we need to finish this race. And why are they important? 
Because Paul taught it. God gave it to Paul, and they are vital for our lives. In chapter 6, later on, Paul is going to repeat this challenge to fight the good fight in verse 12 of chapter 6. Even in the next letter to him, in 2 Timothy, again, in chapter 4, I believe it is, he says to fight the good fight. The word good here implies noble and praiseworthy. I need y'all to know that. The word good here would fight the good fight. Means fight the noble fight. Fight the praiseworthy fight. Y'all ready for this? Some of the fights that we're in ain't worth it. <laughs> Some fights that you are involved in ain't good fights. That fight that you and your spouse have been having, that fight you and your child have been having, they ain't good fights. They're fighting. To you, they're, they're worthy, but they're not good fights. Some of the fights that we see about wars, national battles, neighborhood skirmishes, congregational clashes, Domestic disturbances, not all fights, are good fights. The good fight that Paul had in mind was the battle to defend the truths of God. And in order to engage in the good fight, we need the right kind of weapon. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he reminds the church that the weapons of warfare that we're needing are not the world weapons like we usually do. They're not physical weapons, they're spiritual weapons. In Ephesians chapter 6, which Seth Kendall was mentioning this morning in the announcements, Paul gave an extensive description of our spiritual armor, made up of spiritual qualities and powers that we need for this spiritual battle that we're in. Things like truth, righteousness, faith, and salvation, the gospel, the word of God, and prayer. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, Paul only mentioned two spiritual qualities that Timothy needed for the victory. Maybe these were two areas of weakness for Timothy. Maybe Timothy is struggling in these two areas, and Paul's trying to kindle those fires and rebuild those flames up for him right there. The two spiritual qualities that he mentions for him are faith and a good conscience. Paul is more than likely talking to Timothy about something personally with his faith here. He doesn't want this young preacher quitting like so many young Christians and young preachers do still to this day. The Apostle John wrote about how faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's even an old hymn. It's found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Paul also mentions having a good conscience. Now, here's the cool thing about Scripture, is the Greek language had a different word for everything, and I love this. So Paul used the word good here, and the word good here for having a good conscience is different from the word in verse 18 where he said to, have, uh, to fight the good fight. To fight the good fight and to fight the noble, the praiseworthy fight. The word associated with good conscience here means excellence. A good and excellent conscience is one that is free from guilt. It's a clear conscience that comes as a result of Christ's cleansing blood and walking in God's ways. To triumph over evil, both we and Timothy, we're going to need a good conscience. We're going to have to have faith and a good conscience. These two just go together like peanut butter and jelly. Faith has to do with what a person thinks. Your conscience has to do with how a person lives. The devil can attack a person's beliefs or tempt them with wrong behavior. I had a preacher named Eddie Forehand, was a preacher in South Virginia for years and years and years. He was also an electrolux vacuum salesman who lived in Keysville. This old preacher, when I decided to join the ministry, he said, son, I'm going to let you know right now. The devil will even make you bad or he'll make you busy. I said, brother, what do I do if you don't have a hard time anymore? <laughs> the devil will make you bad. Or he'll make you busy. He's going to mess with you somehow, some way to try to break you. If the devil causes a person to doubt, then they will often slip into a wrong behavior. Because why live a godly life if you have doubts that God even exists? Or what makes a difference in how I live? Does God really care? But if the devil can lead a person into sin, their conscience can prick them and make them know, hey, wait, something's not right here. We need to go back to the old way. This isn't right. Your conscience is there to guide you, to lead you to that good that's needed. So the devil can lead you into sin, but your conscience is going to try to help. They can either abandon, at this point they can either abandon their sin or abandon their faith. And sadly, most folks abandon their faith rather than abort the sin that they're struggling with. You see, church, this ain't a new problem. This ain't nothing new. We look around and say, man, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, it is. But it was doing that back in Paul's day and Timothy's day. It would be doing it in the Old Testament too, church. Notice that that 
was the point Paul was trying to make in verse 19. He says that some people have rejected faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected. I want you to have faith and a good conscience. But some have rejected faith and that good conscience and consequently have shipwrecked the faith. The word rejected here is a strong word that is the deliberate decision to completely ignore the warnings. We've been there. We've done that. We know folks who have. The warnings are there. I can do it again. The warnings are there not to do it. Mom and Dad had told you if you do this, this is what will happen. Uh, I'll try it anyway. You know this. We've seen this. The word reject is strong. It means to completely ignore the warning. We enter into dangerous territory when we refuse to listen to our conscience. Your conscience, the old adage is true, let your conscience be your guide. If we're going to ignore that guide, we're in a world of trouble. This shipwreck metaphor is so perfect and so beautiful, Paul. I love it. We can all imagine the terror and destruction of a shipwreck, how vulnerable you are in the midst of a shipwreck, in the turbulent water, the storm that's running, whether it's in freezing waters or even the warmest of waters. It doesn't matter. You're still going to be scared to death. Paul, personally, we know from Scripture, had been shipwrecked at least four different occasions. And in fact, in one of the times, in Acts chapter 27, the boat that they're on, it hits a sandbar and the ship is just demolished. Pieces of wood go everywhere. Everyone is trying their best to grab a hold of the pieces. Uh, from the pounding waves that are hitting them. And as the ship comes apart, everyone's grabbing their own piece of wood and trying to get on there and trying to save themselves to get to shore. Not everyone can fit on the headboard, but Jack could have rose. You killed him. I can't represent some of y'all. He could have fit on the headboard, church. I'm just saying, if you watch the movie Titanic, thank you for saying it every time I see it. He could have fit on the headboard. In verse 20, Paul goes uh, from the abstract to the concrete. Paul understood the shipwreck, and he gives this analogy, and it's so beautiful. So he moves into verse 20, where he goes from the abstract to the concrete. My man names two of the ones who have shipwrecked their faith. Paul straight throws them out, two of them who have shipwrecked their faith. So far in this letter, Paul has been vague about these false teachers. Have you caught that? Paul's been vague about who is the ones who are causing the problems. In verse 3, he says, certain people. In verse 6, he says, Some have departed from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Here in verse 20, My man throws Hymenaeus and Alexander right under the bus. Calls them out. Good for Paul. I think too often we let sin and struggles go within the church from church folks, and we ignore it, and it can cause a world of problems. Church folks need to be called out sometimes. You hear me now? Preachers need to be called out. Sometimes, and folks don't have a problem calling out the preacher for whatever reason. And that's cool. I like that. I need that. But we need to call each other out. It's biblical. It helps clear up and grow things together. Accountability is a B E A beautiful thing, church. These two were in the church and spreading false doctrine and out, not acting Christ like. Paul said that he handed these two over to Satan so that they wouldn't be taught, uh, they'd be taught not to blaspheme. The phrase he handed over to Satan sounds crucial. This was Paul's way of referring to church discipline and this fellowship, calling them out. Some call this excommunicating them from the church family for a little while. Paul used the same terminology in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. So Paul is talking here about where you have to sometimes, if you have an unrepentant believer, you call them out and say, hey, I'm for your side. Me and you just face to face. Me and you one on one talking. You need to repent and stop this. And if they don't stop, the Bible says that if they won't listen one on one, then take them before the leaders. If they won't listen to the leaders and you still care about them, then take them before the whole church family. We have yet to have one of those in the over 21 years I've been here. I pray you never do. Hey, y'all. Here's Cameron. Cameron, tell them about your sin. We haven't had to do that. I like that. We haven't had to do that. Paul is calling it out. Truth is, church, every person has two choices. If someone calls you out on your sin, you have two choices. The person can either repent and stick with the kingdom of God, or they can be led into the darkness in their sin where they're at. Man, that sounds harsh. Huh? When a person becomes a follower of Jesus, they are to leave the darkness and step on into the light. Come on. 
So when you repent and you say, you know what, I need Jesus to have my sins washed away, I'm all in. You're leaving the darkness behind and you're striving for that light. But why? When a Christian persists in sin and refuses to repent, then Paul is suggesting that we confront them, if we can change them good, if we can help them pray, if we can lead them, that's awesome. But if not, then we say, you know what? We don't have time for this in our church family. You're causing problems in the church family. And you let them out into the darkness of their sin. That just sounds so harsh. That sounds so unloved. That sounds, let's be real, church. That sounds unchristlike and unbiblical and unchurch-ish. Doesn't it? We try to lead. We try to love. We desire to correct and help folks to change in the simple ways and follow God. However, if a person has no desire when their sins are called out to change, if they say, you know what, I don't care what you say, this is the way I want it, and you want to get used to it, get over it. This is who I am. Then they can become an infection. We're all familiar with infections, ain't we? Infections ain't cute things, pretty. We don't like it. Let me ask you this. If you get a huge cut on your hand or your leg, huge cut somewhere in your body, pick parts, I don't care. If that spot starts to get infected and starts to get hot and starts to red up and starts to get pussy and, you know, y'all, some of y'all kind of go to Some of y'all like, you have pictures? Uh, we all look at this differently. If a part starts to get infected, just ignore it, right? It'll get better on its own. If you ignore an infection, what happens? It spreads. It spreads and it gets worse and it gets worse and you might end up losing that section. Why? Because you ignored the infection. If there's an infection, you need to wash it off. If there's an infection, you need to put some salve, some medicine, old homeschool remedy, something on there. You might need to pour those magic bubbles on there and let it fizz up and foam over. If there's an infection, if you ignore it, it's going to get worse and worse. We desire restoration. The hope and prayers that a person will miss fellowship, the engagement and the support of a church family, the prayers for them to take the time and say, you know what? I am in the wrong. You know what? I do need to repent. God, I am so sorry. Forgive me. And I want to get back involved. You know what? I really know those people... They called me out on something that I need to be called out on. It's not a how dare thing. I know what sins they struggle with. Let me call them out. Do that. They, they need to know. But then they also need to repent. This is not a let me get mad and walk away and stay in my sin, church. This is a thank you for bringing it to my attention because I have completely forgotten and I have ignored it. My bad. I need the church. Here in verse 20, Paul said the purpose was that the erring person might be taught to not to blaspheme. These two folks were blaspheming. Blaspheming, we looked at a week or so ago, denying the deity of Jesus Christ, forcing others to deny the power and purpose of Jesus, to have no reverence for Christ at all. Did the disciples right here change? Did the spiritual discipline of Hymenaeus and Alexander have any desire to take? Well, Apparently, it had little to no effect on Hymenaeus because in Paul's second letter to Timothy, we see that this cat is still upsetting Christians and still giving false teachings and still denying the power of Jesus Christ. We don't really know who Alexander is. There's a lot of Alexanders, nor do we really know uh, anything about him. We don't hear anything about him. We can assume that hopefully this worked and he took it and ran with it and it was doing better. But you see something here, church? Church discipline helps some people and irritates the mess out of others. It can make people better, or it can just make people bitter. Church discipline isn't done often, and I praise God that it's not needed to be done often. But when done, and when done correctly, and prayed over, and the elders have laid hands and prayed about these situations, and are on a team and on the same board together, it can lead to a beautiful restoration and multiply and explode the church in beautiful ways. We all get to make our own decisions. We all get to do that. Most of us just get upset, leave, and bash the church and talk about it to everybody. You need to ignore them. This is the type of people they are. The casualty of spiritual war is heartbreaking. 
I love the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is my favorite book in the Bible, and I say this all the time. In fact, Hebrews is my favorite book. Chapter 12 is my favorite chapter in the book of Hebrews. So chapter 12 is my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. In verse 11 of chapter 12, we see, No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Y'all, I hate getting big as a kid. Uh, I hate the fact that I would much rather my dad discipline me than my mom. My dad was like, all right, you messed up, take a belt off, hit you three or four times, and you were done. Cool. That hurt. Hurt bad. Left bruises. But it wouldn't be. Mom would sit you down and talk to you for an hour, make you think about it, spank you, talk to you for another hour, and then she'd go and tell dad he was going to probably do it again. She's going to get beat by dad one time and be over with mom. I hate getting disciplined. I still, to this day, don't like it when Holly has to do the same thing. <laughs> I like how the author of Hebrews says, no discipline seems enjoyable. Nobody wants to do this. Not the one getting disciplined and not the one doing the discipline. Nobody looks forward to this. As a parent, I hated it. My mom used to say it hurts me more than it hurts you, and I never understood that until I became the father, and I had to discipline my children. And I can have tears in my eyes thinking, I don't want to do this, but I need to do this. I need to punish you. I need to get in your face. I need you to know what is right and what is wrong. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. But later on, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline can heal and help the one who is struggling in sin. It also protects the church from falling into those same sins and letting that infection just run around. I love a good roll. A little leaven works through the whole batch. That's the way yeast works. It spreads. In the case of Hymenaeus and Alexander, Paul's action said to the congregation of Ephesus, what these men are teaching is wrong, and an error cannot be tolerated. This infection needs to be cleaned out. It's going to mess with the whole church family and make us all sick and dead. If Paul hadn't corrected them by turning them over, then the whole church would get infected. So what about us today? What lessons can we learn from these three short verses? i got three lessons. You ready? Number one. We must never forget that spiritual battle rages on. We must never forget that this spiritual battle rages on. None of us can escape the battle. This ain't some short-term thing. It's a long-term one. We need to stay strapped or get clapped. Be equipped and prepared for the battle. We must look to God for the help we need to stand and win the victory. Second, we must never forget that false teachers and false teachings are still prevalent today. The devil, devil's e uh, efforts to destroy or discount God's word uh, and God's church have not diminished in our day. In the book of Jude, verse 3, it says, Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to all the saints. Church, we must contend for the faith which requires standing up for truth and standing against what's false and standing firm. Knowing God's word and continuing to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's word is a safeguard against these false teachers and this false teaching. Did you know that... Uh, Experts in counterfeit money, do you know how they train themselves? They memorize and study the real thing. Experts in counterfeit money study all kinds of things, but the most important thing is they immerse themselves in studying the real thing. And why do they study the real thing? Because then it makes the false ones obvious. If they study what real money looks like and real checks and real everything, then they can detect the counterfeit a whole lot easier. Church, the best way to know God's word is to stay in God's word. Get connected in God's word. Come together and grow in God's word so that we can detect these false teachings and false teachers. And finally, we must never forget that any Christian could shipwreck their faith. This might be new to some of us. Any Christian can shipwreck their faith. Christians can still fall away from a saving relationship with Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. I thought once I was saved, I was saved. Well, did that salvation take hold? You see, once saved, always saved isn't true. We don't really see that in Scripture anywhere. 
any Christian can still fall away from the saving relationship with Jesus. Is that true? It's not everyone who starts walking with Jesus continues to walk with Jesus. Not everyone who starts off on that straight path stays on that straight path. You know, Jesus taught a parable about the sower. In this story that Jesus gives about the sower, he says that the, the, the seed was thrown out and it fell on four types of soil. The path, the rocky, the weedy, and the good soils. The soils represent the hearts of people. The seed that fell on the path never got started because it was snatched away by birds. These are the people that started maybe exploring Christianity, maybe asking some questions, but they never made the decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Their hearts were too hard. The seed that fell on rocky soil are the people who joyfully become Christians, but they don't let their faith take root. Their soil of their heart is too thin, too rocky, and when trouble and hardship comes along, they just fall away and keep up, don't keep up their faith. They give it up. The third type of soil that Jesus talks about is the weedy soil. The seed fell in the weedy soil. These are people who become Christians, and they remain Christians, but they're too distracted by the world and wanting to have their own way. They claim Christ, but man, it's a whole lot more convenient for me not to worry about growing in him and staying in him. God is good and all, but man, when it's nice, but when God is in my way, I'd rather do something else. So I'm going to let God and church take my back seat. Y'all, I've been in ministry for 26 and a half years now. Full-time ministry for 26 and a half years. I've seen far too many people, one of these three types, shipwreck their faith despite several efforts to help them and rescue them. It brings tears to my eyes when I think of some of the people that I've seen in fellowship just walk away from church and give it all up. People with whom serve the Lord side by side, who, who now have fallen away from the faith. I hold out to the hope that there's still time on this side of the grave for them to repent and return to Jesus. My greatest joys in ministry have been seeing folks with tear-filled eyes call me, text me, meet me somewhere, and surrender their heart and come to Jesus. While there are so many spiritual war casualties, church, there have been so many spiritual victories. There's been so many who fought the waves, who found that piece of wood and got on it after their shipwreck, who made it to shore, and who returned to Christ and to worship together. You know, we might think that this could never happen to me. You could never happen to my children. It could never happen to my loved ones. <clears throat> never let you defense it down. Never let your defenses in the spiritual battle down. Don't lower them. Because falling away from the Lord can happen to anyone. The storms of life can hit hard, they can hit fast, and they can shipwreck any person who is not plugged in and not keeping a check on others around them. May we fight the good fight together. May we stay and start throwing out more and more life vests to those who are missing, who have started to fall and slip away from faith. May we make Christ our firm foundation. Folks around us can hurt us, distract us, pull us away. He won't. Let's pray to God. Thank you. Thank you for being our firm foundation. God, thank you for calling us out. Thank you for leading us and loving us. And God, thank you that no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, no matter what happens to us and others leave us and curse and abandon us, you won't. You never will. So God, help us not be part of the statistics of those who have shipwrecked their faith. Build us up strong and ever. Help us to come together as a family, as a team. Help us protect this house. In the perfect name of Jesus. Amen.